Uh, if members are content to proceed to the agenda, um, I would like to welcome uh, members to the seventh meeting uh, of the Audit Committee. Uh, if members are content, um, there's no apologies. No. Okay. Um, the clerk uh, has not received apologies from any member of t for today's meeting. Emma Rogan and Alan Chambers uh, are uh, participating uh, via Starleaf as uh, indicated. Um, can I remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest before and during each committee meeting? Uh, can I ask, uh, has any members any interest to declare? No? Okay. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of November 2020, which are pages 6 to 10 of the meeting pack? Can I ask? Uh, sorry, Jack, maybe I should declare an interest. Um, recently it was announced a special audit is to be conducted by the Audit Office of Causeway Coast and Glen Council in relation to their land dealings. I probably was one of the persons whose complaints were, uh, gave okay. rise to that. Same, yeah. So I should yeah. probably declare that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Um, can I ask, uh, in referring members to pages 6 to 10 of the meeting pack, uh, if members are content uh, with the minutes? Read. Okay. Uh, can I refer members to the briefing note from the Assembly's Research and Information Service on Standards of Public Audit Governance uh, uh, in the uh, members table pack? And can I remind members that at the last meeting on the 25th of November, the committee received a briefing on public audit governance and subsequently sought uh, additional information. This paper is included in the pack for noting and will be added to the committee's web pages uh, as agreed. Can I remind members that at the last meeting on the 25th of November, the committee received a briefing on governance accountability arrangements for the Office of the Ombudsman and other legislators and subsequently sought additional information on risk uh, on audit and risk committees and governance supervision. It was anticipated that this paper would be provided at today's meeting, but due, uh, uh, com due to competing deadlines and a delay in receipt of information from other jurisdictions, the paper will be provided in time for the next substantive uh, committee meeting. Can I ask if anyone has any other matters arising from the minutes of the last meeting? No? no. Okay. I uh, remind members uh, that the session is uh, being recorded by Hansard and refer members to the briefing paper and relevant background information at pages 13 to 60 of the members' packs. Members may also wish to refer to the briefing note included in your table pack. Can I uh, welcome today uh, our witnesses, uh, Mrs. Pamela McCready, uh, Chief Operating Officer at the NAO, and Mr. Rodney Allen, Director of Corporate Services at the NAO. You're both very welcome. Uh, invite you both to make a short introductory statement. Indeed. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for having us here today. Um, we met a couple of months ago with regards to our budget, um, and I gave some outline um, views at that, so I'm not going to necessarily repeat that. I think as we are in our corporate planning process, looking from 21 to 24, um, we are reflecting that we're operating in a different environment from the last corporate plan, notably the Assembly's back, um, Brexit, COVID, etc. Um, but a lot of those measures that we were identifying around how we add value, uh, looking at our scrutiny rule, how we support public sector transformation, and indeed how we are a high-performing organisation ourselves, uh, continues to be very relevant as we look into the three years ahead. Um, there's a number of those things as we focus into 21-22 uh, um, that reflects that, particularly around growing our talent, growing our staff and capability within the organisation. Uh, focusing in on our digital transformation and looking at our audit methodology um, and also um, looking at our relevance and breadth of reporting to support the Assembly and PAC uh, as we go forward. So those are the key factors to us uh, as we reflect that in the budget going forward into 21-22. So <laughs> okay. I was going to say at this point, Chair. Well, that's short and sweet. <laughs> We covered it pretty much, I think, before, so yeah, I think you'd be familiar have. with it. It's uh, in our packs as well. Yeah, I, I'll uh, open to members. Uh, Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Pamela, thank you very much for that, uh, Jane, Ronnie, for coming along. With regard to, I suppose there's a few things that we're, we're keen to drill down on. Sure. To make sure that we fully understand. So fr from, from the paperwork that you've given us, there's a letter from the Controller and Auditor General that indicates 
uh, there will be a, a reduction uh, in the officer's income as a, uh, from the audit office. You require us to do less to audit work on European ag agricultural funds following the UK's exit from the EU. Yep. Okay. And then on the other side of that, there's the implementation of the RHI, the auditing of the RHI implementations. Yeah. How do those counterbalance each other? Because on the one hand, there's a reduction. On the other hand, there's an increase. And it seems to me in your budget, there's quite a substantial increase. So how can we, uh, how, can we how do those counterbalance each other? Um, how do they offset each other? And then if I move on from that, also within the documentation you provided, you indicate that, that was my first question. Second question, um, in the documentation provided, you indicate that at present, approximately 30% of your audits are contracted out to accountancy firms. I would like to, to have some understanding as to how that works, um, how you determine which auditors will be used. Is it all the same auditor? Um, what are the opportunities for value for money to be found in that uh, contracting out of work? Then, moreover, you'll have seen now the letter from the Department of Finance that indicates that your budgets are reasonable, but also indicates that you should work from your baseline. So, on that basis, if you were to work on your baseline, could you indicate to us, please, how you will prioritise and also um, what will be cut and what the impact will be on your services? Thank you. I take those in turn. Thank you. And I'll do a little bit in the first one and <laughs> go to Robbie sure. in the income as well. Uh, you're quite right. We've made reference in the pack to the reduction on income from the European Agricultural Funds, which is the audit work uh, undertaken on behalf of the National Audit Office on the EU funds. Um, there's been a little bit of uncertainty around that over the past year. Um, we're getting greater clarity in that, certainly as we look into 21-22. So whilst there's, we'd expected a more significant reduction, but there's been some changes to that as we look into 21-22. So it's a bit of a stepped approach to the reduction in the income, and Rodney might be able to provide a little bit more detail around that. Um, it's quite specific work that we do um, for EAF. Um, Notwithstanding that, there's an element of flexibility within the workforce um, in that work vis-a-vis -vis, uh, more routine financial audit work, etc. I suppose the counterbalance into the RHI work is much more around the public reporting. And we've spoken in the past around part of the focus of the office over the past couple of years with the reduction in the workforce has been to reprioritise that back into the skills and capabilities with the focus on the public reporting in particular. And we have been building that capability in the office and, and seek to do more of that. Um, we've also mentioned in the past, I mean, we have a statutory function, particularly around the financial audit work. We must do that. Um, so we've no option to do that. With the, with the resource beyond that, that's where our focus is in supporting the Assembly further in the scrutiny role, particularly around the public reporting. Um, so it wouldn't be like for like that the teams that would undertake the EAF work um, by way of the financial accounting financial audit uh, would also have the skills around public reporting. Um, so we would have to look at how we would prioritise that work. So but it's not a straight replace one to the other. No, but presumably there's still an equivalency in terms of man hours. There's, if, if you took it on straight, uh, numbers of people are ours, um, but we can't work like that. There isn't necessarily that capability in the public reporting side. At a time in the office, they would have been two quite distinct divisions or teams. Um, in recent years, we've sought to blend the teams um, so that they interface into, say, each of the government departments, um, so that the financial audit team and the public reporting team work as a team, um, and that's to share understanding, knowledge, um, experience in that particular organisation. But there are still, particularly at a more senior level, senior order and above, there would still be people who very much specialise in uh, public reporting vis-à-vis -vis pure financial audit work. We are seeking, um, as we bring through our graduate trainees or indeed any new auditors into the organisation, uh, we are seeking that they would get experience across both those aspects of work, both from a financial audit and get involved in public reporting. Uh, we're looking at a development programme into 2021 uh, where we can support those individuals moving into that aspect of work. Um, and that, that's very much something that's part of, in many ways, the budget. Um, ask is that we can develop that capacity and expertise a little bit more as we move forward to help support additional public reporting. Just a follow up on that particular point, and is there a danger that you train these people up 
and then they are poached by private farms? Mm -hmm. There's, there's a risk in that right across the spectrum. You know, we, we've increased our um, graduate trainees coming into the organisation. Part of that was um, difficulty in the past uh, in recruitment uh, at auditor grade, and that's right across Northern Ireland. So it's, it wasn't just a challenge for the audit office, very much a challenge uh, for the civil service, for the firms as well. So our focus was to increase our graduate trainees, bring people through the organisation, get that experience with a view to seeking to retain a number of those people. For some people, uh, their career path may be um, different and, and in fact they could move into the civil service as well as into the private sector. It's always a risk. Um, it's about the appetite and the enjoyment of the work that they do as far as public sector audit goes vis-a-vis -vis, uh, private sector audit. And what are the trends with regard to that? It's, it's, it's changed over the past number of years. We've recently um, concluded uh, bringing in the graduate trainees, we call it the, our careers fairs, where we uh, bring them in. I mean, numbers in the past, we, we seek, this year we're seeking four to six graduate trainees. Uh, in prior years, we would have had 50, 60 applications for those posts. This year we had 138, I think. Now, that's not just the marketplace. Um, that's also very much what we've done by way of engagement with Queen's University of Ulster and others. Um, very much our brand and promoting what we do. Um, I think a lot of that's been picked up on social media, which for the graduate trainees they can see and access. We do guest lectures in the universities. Everything about uh, raising our profile about what we do and what we are as an organisation. So from that point of view, the calibre has been outstanding this year. We've shortlisted list those down to 22 and those interviews are next week. So. It's a really important aspect to our recruitment, um, the graduate trainees coming through into the organisation. And we have now for 18, 24 months um, been recruiting at auditor level and a number of those individuals have been successful and then uh, have moved in substantively to the organisation. Is there anything else, Rodney, on just the income side? Just very briefly, I mean, the, ret the retention, the point, the point you're making, Joanne, the retention's been very good. Um, the, the contract has changed over the years. Just stepping back into the history of time, it used to be we offered, we trained our accountants up in the SIPFA qualification. Uh, and back then they had almost an automatic right to stay with us once they became qualified and moved through the grades. That was unsustainable. Um, so we changed that. We now train our accountants in the chartered profession. Um, and then they, 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 they really reached the end of their 42 month contract with us. Um, that's it, it's terminated. But we're, we're trying to be in a situation where we're constantly in the marketplace looking for auditors. So a lot of those people are coming back into us and they're really good people. We have lost some people to the private sector firms, back to the heart of your question. Um, we have, they've went to build a career elsewhere. We have to accept that that'll happen and we've lost some to the public service. That's fine because if we've invested particularly in the public service, we've invested in training these people up to become really good accountants, the wider public sector gains. Um, some really good people, we can't provide a career path for everyone yes. because they're talented. We also heavily recruit from the private sector at those auditor grades, so <laughs> swings and roundabouts right. a little bit. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, that one, if I sort of keep going, is that okay? Um, second question you asked me was around contracting out, um, and I think we touched on this a little bit um, the last time. So, approximately 30% of our financial audit work, so this is just financial audit uh, and not in, on the public reporting, is contracted out. Um, we touched back on sort of the precedence on that from years ago and, and why that was the case. The majority of the reason for us is really the peak, <laughs> with the exception of 2020, um, where pre-summer recess uh, certification places a real bulge in the demand of work to be done, particularly in that April, May, June period and the run-up to pre-summer recess. If we staffed fully to service that, um, we would have people the remainder of the year that wouldn't be too busy. Uh, so that, that, in part, um, is the reason. Um, you ask, we, we recontracted, uh, we re-tendered this uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we got into a rhythm that um, so many audits would be tendered each year, and we tried to catch up with that and put it in a new place, and we went full OG and, and took a very different approach to it. Um, and we set a five-year contract, so slowly but surely, any of those uh, that were still uh, had period of time on them have been coming into that. Hence, there's a little bit of a, an increased cost going into next year. A large focus of the retendering was around a focus on quality. Um, and that's not to say that there was a flaw in the quality, but we wanted to invest more heavily with the organisations uh, to ensure that, and we put specific requirements in the tender specification around that. We have a very, very rigorous monitoring process where we engage with those organisations. Um, there's regular um, 
assessments that they have to do and provide to us and we meet them on a formal basis, etc., etc., around assuring ourselves of the quality. Um, there are a number of organisations, it's not one organisation. Um, so at the moment we have PwC, Deloitte, Grant Thornton, ASM are mainly the contracting firm or the private sector firms that work with us. I think I mentioned before there's a slight difference <coughs> in Northern Ireland, maybe compared to some of the other jurisdictions where in some of the other um, countries, those private sector firms will certify directly to government. In Northern Ireland, they don't. They provide a shadow audit certificate and the CNAG still certifies the accounts. So it's very much they undertake the work, provide us with their, their view on that, their certification on that. But we still have a role in that and we still we will still undertake a little bit of additional work ourselves or we will also um, provide an additional layer of, of scrutiny, review files, etc. on that. To give you assurance on it, um, those, those Back to who, what jobs and why, um, it's risk assessed, so anything of a particularly high risk uh, retains within the audit office and we undertake that work. Um, that is a priority to us. In the past, um, health services audit, as it came into the Northern Ireland Audit Office, so at a point in time health service audit sat separately, uh, that came into the office a number of years ago. Um, it's significant in its volume of work and again it's significant in a pre-summer recess period. Um, so a significant amount of health audit is contracted out, but for instance, one trust remains with ourselves in addition to all resource accounts, i.e. Department, departmental audit, is retained in the audit office. So there's a selection of um, NDPBs, etc., that go to the private sector organisations. Some areas of specialism uh, around pensions, for example, are contracted out, um, and there's uh, roughly a third equal ratio of the local government work is contracted out as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, ju just in, in terms of... Excuse me, Chairman. You okay? We didn't reach the point of prioritisation. Oh, sorry. Cuts and impacts on services. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but those are big issues for me. Oh, that's okay, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, we've built into the budget um, what we believe we need to um, build that staff base uh, from taking quite a significant reduction as we've outlined in the paper. So from going from a reduction of 40 people to try and build that headcount back up to support the organisation, to support us, support the assembly uh, really in the scrutiny rule. So the additional 425,000 as we have put into the budget request mm -hmm. really is to en enable us uh, some additional recruitment uh, to do that. Um, and we've currently um, a two-year pay deal, um, albeit with the caveat of funding, uh, built into that. So those are the couple of factors that require that additional funding. Um, I have touched on there isn't an option um, around the financial accounting or financial audit side, so that has to be done. So any impact on our service provision to the Assembly and to the PAC would be on the public reporting side. Um, and that would have to be a discussion around if we didn't... Um, we have a public reporting programme that we commit to deliver um, over a three-year period, individual years. More pressure is coming in that at the moment, particularly in the light of COVID and additional work around some of the grants work coming out of that, etc. And we did reprioritise re that in year, um, but we can see additional demands coming on that. So the majority um, of our service that would in many ways be compromised would be on the public reporting side and the scrutiny rule uh, to the Assembly. But if you had to work within your baselines, what happens? We don't, we don't, um, we're not able to fulfil to the level that we have considered and engaged and consulted with yourselves, PAC and others on the level of public reporting that we would seek to do. And how would you prioritise that work accordingly then? You know, within that category? We would have to engage with the Auditor General on um, what areas were deemed the greatest priority. I think the issue comes with the extent at which, you know, that starts to compromise his independence, I suppose, around what's deemed important on that scrutiny rule, but it would just have to be prioritised and, and understood as to why that was the case. We would do it in consultation, but ultimately he would have to decide what, what areas would go forward for review. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joanne. Uh, Emma Rogan, would you like to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions, if possible. Um, I have my camera off, just in case you're wondering, because um, my 
my signal's really poor and if the camera's on then I, I when I go to speak I, yeah. I lose everybody yeah. um but that's sort of down for you and the really bad internet um <laughs> Just a couple of questions though. Um, the data um, enabled, enabled financial audit approach, um, which is being developed, I, I take it at the minute, uh, will it have any short or long term impacts on your budget? Um, Thank you, Emma. Okay, sorry, um, I'm scribbling in case you can't see me so that I don't forget that what you've asked me. Um, yes, this is with regards to the work that we're undertaking on data analytics. Um, and yeah. we've touched on that, that we're, we're just past the proof of concept and we're working now very much on the product and how it can support us, particularly in our financial audit work. Um, I've mentioned that in addition to that, uh, and we're collaborating with our colleagues in Audit Scotland and Audit Wales on that, so they have joined us in the pursuit of that. But in addition to that, we've invested into a small team where we've, um, and when I say small, I mean a couple of people, um, focusing on the data analytics in the office. Um, so that is already supporting um, the financial audit teams um, during the audits. In fact, over the summer, um, we're already in the planning work for next year, so it supports them in that. There's many aspects to it. It adds to the quality of the audit. So aspects of the analytics um, can target the teams towards certain uh, risk areas, for instance, so that gives us a, a stronger, more quality um, audit. Um, it's also supporting some of the work currently um, in the public reporting side as well. So, for instance, we touched on the work that we've um, been seeking to pursue around uh, COVID and the grants with Department for Economy. So, anything where there's large volumes of data where we can match data and interrogate it, um, it's enabling us to do that as well. So, that's the short term. What was your point as to going into the long term? It fits with our review on our financial audit methodology. And it does need to become an integral part of how we audit and not just an additional way or added quality, which it's, which it's doing at the moment. Um, and that's the, case, that's the case across all of public audit and private sector audit as well. So there's a point where there's efficiencies that should be gained from it. Um, and there's an element then of focusing some of that back in so that our, our work can be tailored to improve the quality of our audit work. Um, and ultimately, there could be an element of efficiency as we go through that process as well. So there is a two-fold or two-pronged outcome really to that. But a large part of it is quality and improvement, increase in quality and focus in the audit. Um, but you would, you would anticipate that there's an efficiency with it as well as we move forward once we actually get it fully operational. It's very much in development stage. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. And just one. Um, so the proposed budget increases um, that, that, are, that are in the report, will that bring um, the audit office back to pre-austerity air levels? Um, no, um, I'll say no, but I'll pass over to Rodney because he, he loved the detail on that. It certainly doesn't, Emma, but I'll let him provide you with the detail. No, the simple, thank you. The simple answer, Emma, no, it doesn't. Uh, just to go back into history, about 10 years ago, pre-austerity, uh, the audit office had around about 140 um, full-time equivalent members of staff. Um, what, we're, what we're asking the committee to support us on in this, this, this journey over the next three years is to try and get us up to 125 um, full-time equivalent members of staff. Um, you'll appreciate that that, that is the very much the large proportion of our budget. So we're still going to be somewhere 10% shy um, by full-time equivalent compared to where we were 10 years ago. And if I can just sort of one final point I had um, rem remembered this morning from our session in February, um, this committee had commissioned raised to sort of have a look at the, right, the yeah. budgets across the organisation. So um, Emma, sort of three, four organisations, and one of them is ourselves with a 4.3% uh, reduction in our budget from 2016-17 vis-a-vis the remainder of the departments, which have increased over that period of time up into around 15%. So... We're one of a few that had a real-time reduction on our budget, um, and even with this um, £400,000 increase that we're, we're bidding for, um, it's still very much well below the baseline from, from a number of years ago. Okay, Emma. Okay, thanks, Chair. And just to supplement that, obviously the renovations are ongoing in your, uh, uh, in your building, uh, or, yeah, they are ongoing. Uh, the estimated cost yep. uh, of those have increased uh, as outlined at the last meeting, uh, there is an element of that building that is going to be leased out. Mm -hmm. What ha uh, This was touched on earlier, but I'm just wondering, so the revenue raised as a result of that, does that offset the costs? And then would that, will that make it more 
likely or less likely to be asking for certain sums of money in the year next year. Okay, I'll pass over to Rodney on that one. Sure. We've factored all of that in, Chairman. You're exactly right. The, the income that's coming in goes directly towards the running costs of the office. Just to pick up your point, um, we've done a lot of work since we were last with you a couple of months back yeah. talking about the accommodation project. So we were at that point um, asking you to support us for £6 million and next year, 21-22, is the year when most of that expenditure will be incurred. Um, we've reassessed some of the assumptions. We've, we've reassessed everything. Uh, I took that back. We've done a very extensive review of the business case using our advisors from um, SIB and the DCPD. Uh, we stepped back because we're further advanced in the process. We've stepped back our optimism bias and we've, we've re reflected on the construction inflation because the position isn't as bad as what the experts were saying at a point in time. So that has taken another 400,000 out of the overall cost on the capital side. Um, so we're down now to about 5.6 million. Now, we'll not know until we go through procurement where that's really going to land. But if everything is, is accurate and, and the estimates are in the right place, then it should be in and around that, that envelope. Should so, remember, what was the original uh, uh, four. fast four? About 4.3-ish, I think, was the number we talked to you about. And then we went through our IBA stage three and the design. And you remember we talked about the windows and we talked about additional furniture costs, yeah, et cetera, and all moved in one direction in the inflationary estimates. Um, so we're now seeing that step back a bit. Next week, um, the accommodation board in the office is due to receive the uh, RIBA Stage 4 report. So this is us through the very technical, detailed M&E structural design stage, um, down to where sockets are going and floors, etc. Um, so we'll really get another cost sense next week. But you know, I'm, I'm really expecting that it will be in and around the numbers that we're talking to you about today. And the next stage, as you will know, is we move then to procurement. Yeah. Um, before we could we could decant um, the building in tandem with that. The um, your point on the on the, the income stream. That is also modelled, and we've assumptions in, and we've again used another expert from SIB to assist us in the um, assumptions and looked at the market and what the likelihood is for getting that rental stream, um, etc. Um, so all, all built in to uh, support the business case that justifies us being still on the right path with the project. And what is the the estimated level of income that will be received from rent? <laughs> you turn into detail. Off the top of my head, Chairman, we're, it's in the region of about 150,000 per year. Okay. And do you foresee any difficulties, particularly given the current climate that we're in, in trying to lease such premises when there is now an attitude of or a change towards working more working from home? Particularly in terms of office space? I'll pick that and let you find your detail. <laughs> uh, there was two elements to that for us. We we a number of options as we considered the refurbishment for ourselves. We could have left the wing, which is the, the piece that would be leased out as it is, and not refurbish it. Um, but we took the view that if we refurbished it as well as our own, we had a better chance as we went to market to secure a tenant. Um, it's not a huge space. Um, as I've mentioned, we've had, we've had two tenants um, in that space over the past couple of years. But actually, on reflection on COVID and usage need and um, square footage needed by you know, small to medium-sized organisations, it is a good size space. And the feedback from our colleagues in Strategic Investment Board is that it, it is quite a marketable space. And especially if it was refurbished to a, a, you know, a good standard, um, nothing's, uh, nothing's certain. Um, and that's built into a number of our risks and assumptions in our business case. And we have built in... Uh, periods of time that it would take you if you had a tenant to replace it and if you weren't successful, etc. So a lot of those assumptions are built into our costings uh, in the business case that there would be periods of time that you may not uh, always have a tenant there. Find your detail, yeah. No, I'll copy the 55-page business case, but I don't, have, <laughs> I don't have the appendix that has that detail, yeah. but happy to provide no, it. It's in the region of that. Yeah. We've, I mean, it, compared to what we've had, you know, our rental income uh, for that space has been quite ad hoc as we've consolidated ourselves into the, the front wing of the building. Um, we've been securing in around £50,000, but as we did, a, as we would move forward in, in a more substantive way, um, you know, that's, you'd have yourself in a very different space. So all of the accommodation hasn't been rented out or leased out so, at so the same time. The, obviously, the, the, the parts that aren't leased out will be liable for rates, although at a vacant rate. Yeah. And that usually be liable for that. Yeah. What? what I'm just, I'm just thinking with the climate we're in, is there a significant cost to rates on that as well? Again, we, we built the risk associated with all of that into the business case. Um, I mean, our rate bill at the minute is in the region of about uh, £180,000, £190,000 a year. 
So we're leasing out about 40% of the building. So now we, we'll, we'll continue to pay the rates in full and charge against the, the tenant. So with rates and with service charges, there, there's always there's risk associated with it, yes. So the, the rep, just, just to be clear, and then I'll move on to uh, Alan Chambers and, and then Jim Alistair. The rent, the estimated rent, is inclusive of right. rates and service charges? No, we, we do a basic rent, and on top yeah. of that goes your service charge and your rates. Right. Mm -hmm. So we get a gross income, so it's whether we compare gross against net. Yeah. Um, so we get a gross income, and of course it nets off against some of the standing, the standing costs, which are the rates and the services. Okay. Okay. So whenever you say, sorry, Chairman, 150,000 yeah. a year, is that gross or net? That's the rental income. That's net. That's the rental yeah. income. Yeah. Yeah. Thank but you, I, yeah. I, I, you appreciate, Joanne. I need to have the detail in front of me on yeah. those figures, just. But yeah. Uh, Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, just, uh, am I correct in assuming that it's, it's more cost effective to carry out audits in-house rather than outsourcing? Uh, and if that is the case, uh, what, what's the percentage uh, difference in cost of, of doing it in-house rather than outsourcing? And when a, an audit is carried out by one of the outsource companies, uh, do they just do the speed work or do they come back with recommendations at the end of the audit or, or does your office uh, actually um, come up with the, uh, the recommendations and conclusions uh, at the end of the audit? Okay, thanks Alan. If I pick that up and Bobby yeah. can come in as well, possibly. Um, by way of cost effective, this is one of the advantages in many ways of having um, a mixed um, delivery is that we are able to benchmark the cost of our audits um, with the audits that are contracted out. Um, and in the main, those compare favourably. So it's not to say that one's exceptionally more expensive or cheaper than the other. In the ballpark, um, they're, they're, they're quite comparable. Um, the organisations undertake the complete audit. Um, so for the organisations that they're auditing start to finish, um, they undertake that work. And they take that right through to the report charged with governance uh, and reporting back to the relevant audit body. Um, our teams um, that are involved uh, with that sector uh, may also attend those audit committees as well. So, for instance, the director responsible for health, um, if we're not conducting that particular trust audit, uh, would still be involved in the planning, understand what's happening, sign off the, the, in many ways the audit work that's going to be undertaken, uh, and would be aware of the issues. So we need sight right across um, all those audits uh, as well. But substantively, they undertake um, the full scope of the audit work. Is there anything more? Um, I the, 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 this is all part of the reason for contracting out. We test ourselves um, against the market when we, when we undertake the process. I mean, the contracting out goes back to 2001 on a Sharman review when Lord Sharman recommended that, that it would be appropriate to have in the region a 25 to 30 percent of public audit um, with private sector firms, one of which is to test that, that tension um, in costs. Um, we, we have noted following our recent round, um, Alan, that and audits that are comparable, and Pamela made a point earlier about risk profile associated to them, so I'd emphasize we need to be comparing like for like. Um, we're, we're in the same space if we look at it purely on cost, uh, whereas it, you know, there's, not, there's not much between the cost that it takes the audit office to do it and the cost that it takes a private sector firm to do it. There's very little, we're splitting hers. Um, they, do it, they do it all, they produce a full report, recommendations included. So you, you will have seen these in, in other arenas where you know, the report to those charged with governance, as it's called, or in my old language, the management letter comes through. Um, the firms draft that. And it's back to the point that was made earlier about us looking for better quality, because we were finding, to, to, to be honest, that in the, a few years ago, that on these contracted out audits, um, we weren't getting much by way of recommendations. So that added value you know, improving the internal control environment, for instance, within an organisation, not much was coming through relative to what we were doing in our own in-house audits. Uh, so that's one of the things we've been, we've been looking for um, from the firms is to provide uh, better recommendations that, that we can uh, add added value through all of that commitment. Well, thank you. OK, he's happy enough. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jim Alistair. Yeah, I want to take you back to Joanne Bunting's first question because I don't think we got anything like an adequate response. Mm -hmm. She asked you what would be the, say, uh, the uh, loss of income uh, in losing the EU agricultural funds mm -hmm. auditing. Can you quantify that for us? Yeah, yes, Chairman. Um, at, 
the moment, it's in the region. It's a big, it's a big chunk of business for the audit office. It's about six hundred thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. So how that works? We we're a consortium with um, England, Scotland, and Wales, and it's driven by the National Audit Office on behalf of the UK. And the, the National Audit Office bills the EU, and then and then that gets divvied out amongst the regions, of which we receive about six hundred thousand pounds. That has grown over the years because of the amount of work that's required on the European agricultural funds. So that's tailing off now with, with um, the exit from the European Union, and you'll see it, the net effect of it in, in the tables that we've provided, but it's, that 600 is tailing off over about the next three to four years. So we're losing that full, in, that full income stream. So in so the year 21-22, yes. we're looking at what's your income going to be from that? Uh, we're down just about £200,000 below that, so we're looking at 400000 400000 right. So the resources... Do you want me to keep going? Yeah. The resources associated. Back to Joanne's question. Um, so that frees up next year two hundred thousand pounds worth of resources. So we can move those people across into our into our public audit stream, our reporting stream. Um, that work that we're providing to the assembly. Now we need those people to deliver. Now we they're coming into that FT equivalent. We're simply reallocating them, but we're losing the income stream. So it comes with a cost. So you're still going to have four hundred thousand from the EU audit work. That's right. Uh, there is vague talk about the RHI oversight. Can you put a figure on the cost of that? If I pick up an aspect of the RHI work, and I know this, Joanne, was a question from you previously, um, it's not, um, whilst we have a senior auditor heavily involved in that aspect of the RHI work, it's very much a blended response. Um, so the work to date, um, I've mentioned that we will look at this from specific topics uh, and themes coming out of RHI. So, for instance, capacity and capability was an issue coming through in the RHI report. We've just concluded in that, and it's just commenced uh, through PAC at the moment. Um, we've issued good practice guides um, on raising concerns, which was, again, a thematic issue coming out of RHI. Good practice on guide on records matter. Uh, again, it was also an issue How identified. How much is all that costing you? I can come back to you with the budget figures against each of those topics. I, can, I don't have that uh, to my fingertips at the moment. But, but if, we're, if we're to be satisfied mm -hmm. that you need what you say you need, mm -hmm. how could we ever be satisfied if we don't have such component figures as that? Well, I can certainly get you those because we, for each of those studies, we develop a, a plan for those studies. There's a budget for those studies. Uh, we conclude when those studies the actual cost against those, so that's very easy to get to you, and I'm more than happy to do that. What's your efficiency savings for next year? Just pick up the first question. Yeah. Just to go back, we're, we're committing in the region 150,000 a year mm -hmm. on, on all of those different ways of following up on RHI. But, but that's the figure you were looking for. No. In terms of context of the department saying to us that. Uh, you will be required to live within your opening baseline and absorb significant pressures. What efficiencies are you planning? We have, we have efficiencies in the region of, and it's in our paper, we had estimated all of our costs would be about 600,000, and instead we're down to 425, so we've 175, which we found already before we fed anything. Um, I, we're cited in the department's letter and we acknowledge that they have asked um, consideration to be given to the wider public sector landscape. So when you say there's 175,000 we found already, should we therefore conclude there's more to be found? A big part of the cost that you're referring to um, is a case of we've built into our budget build of that 425,000 additional costs. So in many ways, the efficiency is you don't do that. You know, we don't recruit the people that we're anticipating that we would need uh, going into 21-22. So you, you just don't incur some of that cost. That's well, let me ask you a little bit about your staffing. You went into the voluntary exit scheme. Mm -hmm. And the promise of the voluntary exit scheme was long-term savings. Mm -hmm. You went in with 140 staff, you emerged with 102, and now you're shooting back up to 125 with a, a pay bill at the highest it's ever been, eight million. Where's the long-term savings from the exit strategy, from the um, exit scheme? Part of our savings, um, I mean, you're right, we did crystallise those savings. Uh, so there was three million pounds saved on those. Um, and the paper that, in response to a question from Joanne at the last meeting, we got back the profile of that. Mm -hmm. 
we very much restructured the organisation um, and removed sort of that some senior director audit manager grades and invested into sort of a restructured capacity and capability of the organisation. So for us, there's been an aspect of reinvesting into the skills required um, for the organisation to deliver against its requirements. But you're essentially wanting to restore an aspect. 60% or maybe more of the staff figure that you, that you had. And we're doing that through a much more efficient, through the graduate trainee programme, mm -hmm. the higher level apprentice, and recruiting in an auditor grade and training those people to undertake the aspects of work that we need them to do. So ensuring that we've got the right capacity and capability in the organisation to deliver. That has been very much a focus of our corporate plan over the past couple of years. In terms of income streams, apart from the leasing of the property, have you any discretion or capacity to charge for your services? For example, you audit councils. Do you charge them? We do. Yeah. Yeah, so approximately 40% is hard charged. Um, aspects of the audit we call notional. So the audit... 40% of what? Of our audit work is charged, hard yes. charged. And, uh, and how do you charge that? Do you charge that at the rate that PwC would charge it? Or do you charge it at some different rate? We have our early rates that we identify in the office against our costs based on our cost management information. And how often are they reviewed? Annually. And what's the uplift? Approximately 5% is where we are on the, mm -hmm. on the uh, charge out rates, as we call them. And again, we compare those to the contracted out audits um, by way of a comparative cost exercise. So what's your income from charging out? Do you know the income figure from our hard charge, from our um, contracted out? It's in the region of uh, just short of £2 million. Yeah. So. Hmm. so we, we're, we're, our hands are tied in many ways. There's a, most of our work we cannot under statute charge for. Mm. Yes, yes, but yes. the work that we can charge for, we yes. do, and we, char we charge 100%. So for example, if you bring in about two million pounds on the uh, hard charge, and you have a pay bill of eight million, is the two million paying for a quarter of your staff or not? The two million is covering a quarter, uh, roughly a quarter, of well, twenty percent of the gross cost of the office. Yes, but the of, of your eight million staff, of, of those staff that are going to cost you eight million pounds, what's the productivity of those in terms of the hard charging? You've lost me a wee bit in the, product <laughs> in the productivity. Um, I'm struggling with the question. Well, the question is. You send in expert staff to audit the council. At the end of that, you present them with a bill. Is that bill actually covering the costs of those staff? We're required to charge 100% of our costs. So in, in the environment where we are charged. Yes. Yes. So it includes salaries and overheads. It's calculated at a rate that absorbs all costs of the office. I think that's why we were, our faces were, because it's, it's not just the staff cost, it's the contribution uh, of those staff to that work. It's an absorbed cost. So if you didn't get the uplift you're looking for, What happened? As I've said earlier, um, we have a statutory requirement to do one aspect of our core delivery in the office. Uh, we have financial audit work, we have public reporting, uh, we have the work that we do around our counter fraud, etc. Um, some of that's not negotiable, so we have to do that, and that's the statutory assurance to the, to the assembly. Can you put a figure in that? We could, we would, it would be done through, it's, as I've said, the focus is on the studies on the public reporting and the scrutiny to support PAC in the Assembly. So it would be a reduction in what we would do um, and there would have to be discussion around what the priority of that was. Yeah, th to sure. like in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, 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 if the committee is not inclined to approve the £425,000, then that's £425,000 of resource that we don't have. That could be for toxic um, four reports to PAC. Mm. That, that, that's our... I'm, I'm, 
trying to contextualise it for yeah, you. That, that would be four reports that we wouldn't be able to reduce and take through the accountability of, of PAC. You have the safety net of monitoring around, yes. We could bid. It doesn't provide much certainty, but of course we could bid. I mean, our, our, our preference, as you would imagine, is to try and, 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 and hold and protect that position that we want to achieve. And then as we, as as we will... Target, just a desirable position for every department. Uh, but uh, not everyone can get I, all they want. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Elser. But you know, I mean, I suppose we, we, you know, the CNAG did have to write to the, the, the Secretary of State back in 2019 because he just felt that he had a budget that wasn't enabled him to deliver for the citizens of of, of, of Northern Ireland um, a proper, independent public audit function. And I suppose that's what we're asking you for: is, is support in delivering a proper public audit function. Um, if, in turn, your point in the baseline, I mean, we, we will surrender at the earliest opportunity yeah. to, to the department so that best use can be made of public funds if we that find that we can't recruit. We do. I mean, we do. It's back to the earlier conversation about how we can recruit, when we can recruit, and yeah. building that base up. You know, we've, we, we have got, we, we can fully justify a payback period, a very significant payback period on VES, where, where we've saved in, um, £3 million and taken all those senior posts out. And now we're bringing posts in at the lower levels. And back to the earlier question, we'll still not be anywhere near the 140. It'll still only get us up to 125 at best, and that's that's what we're asking you for. We're very tight for time. Thank you. you uh, very briefly, Joanne. And yeah, it's, it's just a really straightforward one. With regard to financial audit versus public reporting, yep. what's, what's the difference? So in, in that sense, presumably you, you will still audit the department, you will still make recommendations and so on? Yes. Um, and those will still be made public and be given to the assembly scrutiny committees and so on. So what's the fundamental difference? Do you want me to take it, Pamela? Yeah, uh, yeah if you, you want. Well, you give, <laughs> give you think of that. Exactly. The, the financial audit is, is, is the, the standing annual audits that we do year, year by year when we go into audit a council, uh, a government department, that we're required to, to fulfil that audit and give those opinions, on, and that's done under statute. Um, there's statute as well for the public reporting. It's maybe in the language, sorry. Value that's the money. financial audit. And then the public reporting, the value for money. Those, those areas where the CNAG and indeed the local government order has more discretion to do standalone pieces. And those are the substantive pieces, I have to say, that end up going through the, the assembly. And go back, then you're going back a number of years, you're looking at trends and patterns. And no, so no, these would be thematic. So if you take, you know, thematic. our major capital projects report, the capacity and capability, yep. um, et cetera, et cetera. So in the, in the main, if you think... The reports that go to PAC on, on thematic or topical issues as opposed to giving assurance in the financial statements. Okay. And how often, how many of those do you do a year? We have a programme which we've furnished. So we have a three-year programme uh, and it varies. Um, there would be eight or nine what I would call substantive large value for money reports. But we've got shorter turnaround reports, impact reports, good practice guides, etc. So in the region of 25 to 30 a year of those we would do. Okay, John. We're yeah, lovely, well you. over time. Uh, Pamela, Ravi, thank you very much for being here and for your uh, uh, presentations and for okay. answering our questions. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, until until next time. <laughs> thank you, Chairman, thank you members. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our uh, next session is with uh, NIPSO. Uh, we're slightly over time, so I just would urge people to keep their questions quite brief if possible. Um, can I refer members to the briefing paper and relevant background information at pages 62 to 92 of our members' packs? Considering. And can I welcome back to the committee uh, Margaret Kelly? Uh, Paul McFadden and John McGinley on Starleaf. Okay, you're very welcome. Back. Daniel, thank you. Uh, can I uh, invite you to make a short opening statement? Thank you, and sorry for the wait. No, not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to the committee for giving us time to consider the budget again in the light of the Department of Finance comments. Um, and I do welcome that the Department of Finance didn't identify any particular issues with the budget, but we do recognise that this has been an unprecedented time and that we have made our submissions in the light of the potential financial impact of the pandemic. And we do 
recognise that that makes it difficult. Um, the budget, as outlined and as previously discussed with committee, does represent a consideration of the role and function of the office and how we can best serve the public interest by delivering that role as effectively as possible. It has asked for an overall increase of just over 300,000, mm -hmm. and I wanted just to take a few moments to put that in context again across a few key areas. In terms of managing complaints and investigations within our budget, um, as committees aware, our levels of complaint have more than doubled within the last number of years, um, and we do view this as a long-term and sustained increase. We have committed to delivering our investigations within this budget, continuing to provide an effective services, service to citizens seeking redress, and to provide fair, impartial and proportionate investigations. Um, we have had a significant focus on both settlement and resolution, which is a really good outcome for both complainant and the public body, but it does also increase our cost effectiveness, so we would continue to aim to deliver, as we have said, within that. Um, we have looked for additional funding around improvement, learning and engagement, and I just wanted to say a little bit about why we feel that's necessary. Um, we really want to ensure that we have the resource to reach out both to more disadvantaged citizens or groups who might not automatically find their way to us, or indeed people who find the complaints um, landscape very complex and confusing, and also to both public bodies and their representative organisations to ensure a level of engagement and learning. And we want to use the knowledge and insight from complaints in order to enable public services to improve. As I've said to committee, this is an integral aspect of Ombudsman's offices across the UK, many of which have been delivering on that aspect for some time. Um, as members will know, there's a wealth of learning from complainants' experiences of our public services, and we believe that that should be captured and shared. And although the office has begun to work on that, it has been done on an ad hoc basis, and I don't believe that we can achieve the impact and the learning we want without some additional support. And that's why I have included a proposal for two additional members of staff in order that we can begin to proactively build that work, to really begin to engage with public services on a more regular basis, to analyse complaints and trends, to be able to provide annual sectoral responses that look at complaints and areas for improvement, and to share those analysis and reports with this committee and other subject interest committees, and to allow the work that comes from complaints to feed into policy development. Um, I can, in terms of questions, give some examples, just in areas like social care, but also possibly in schools, we can do that working. And the final area is the Complaint Standards Authority. And the introduction of the Complaint Standards Authority does come with associated costs. Um, these were already in the baseline budget, and last, year budget, last year's budget had these costs of 50 per cent. The current budget in front of committee has a full year of those costs. So we are beginning a process with the Assembly Committee, or sorry, Commission, in relation to CSA. We hope to meet with them in late January, early February, and there will be a process of scrutiny and consideration before any such commencement takes place but we think it's appropriate for us to include this in our budget as it's a possibility that that's going to happen in the year ahead. Um, overall, we do hope that our NIPSO budget represents value for money and that committee will give consideration to those additional amounts, which taken together, we hope we'd have significant impact across the public sector for, relatively speaking, a low amount of costs. Um, and we are obviously happy to answer committee questions around it. Thank you uh, very much for that presentation. Um, I, I'll start a, a few comments just when I get a, 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 if it's OK. Uh, I, I've noted that you've said that the levels of complaints have doubled, uh, and I know that has been mentioned in a number of the, our sessions. Uh, what would be the implications of the NIPSO budget for 2021-22 being set aside at an opening baseline position? Um, what would be the resultant reduction in service delivery and impact on the body uh, on your work? And also, how would uh, NIPSO absorb identified pressures and mitigate the impact on service delivery? Three questions there. 
there is. <laughs> um, so if I, I maybe start and then I'll maybe ask both Paul yeah. and John to come in if that's okay. Um, so I do think that would present a real difficulty for us and a real pressure in the office. And I know I am relatively new in post, almost four months now, but I can see that there has been really significant effort to manage those increased complaints within that baseline budget, um, but it is sustained and ongoing. It has meant that some of that other work for real long-term impact and change hasn't been able to take place, and I do think it would present some very real difficulties for us in terms of really delivering that quality of service. I mean, I think Paul can maybe speak to a, a bit about how we've done yeah. that and the possible impact, but I think you would be stretching our service and stretching the quality of service, and I suppose in many respects, stretching the opportunity for complainants to have proper redress and for public services to have proper learning. Sure, yeah, just to build on a little bit on how we have kind of dealt with this, and I know I have touched on this at previous committee, more recent committee sessions, but I think that sustained increase, and it is a long term sustained increase now since the year before NIPSO came into, um, and came into play, has been challenging, and particularly with that kind of annual year budget and in-year budget cycle, which restricts how you can recruit, the permanent basis in which you can recruit, because you're obviously not recruiting until you know, a good portion into the year. Um, but we have met that through um, you know, increasing our focus on proportionality. You know, we, we, t we look at the proportionality, the practicality and the public interest of complaints before we pursue them to the latter stages of further investigation. Um, and, and as I've, I've referenced a few times to the committee now, I think the increase in focus on settlement, um, early resolution, you're referring complaints back for local resolution by the body when that is in the best interest of not just the complainant but often all parties because it reaches a solution which um, is often achieved within 10 weeks of receipt by us uh, and prevents the, the inevitable complexity and cost associated with the full investigations. I think just on terms of the impact of that, I think that the obvious impact if we were to see the continued sustained increases in complaints and having to manage within that sustained budget or restricted budget you are looking at you know, more, more time. You are looking at potentially backlogs if we are hit by um, a surge of complaints around about COVID, which, we, again, we've touched on previously, and it is a real prospect that that could come to us. So it would bring real challenges. It feels that we have taken as, you know, many, as many steps as we possibly can over the last three to four years to, to try and build in that capacity to manage that increase. OK, and in and, and light of, of, of um or previous discussions and indeed in terms of what I've just touched on. Given your current budget as it sits, blunt, being bluntly but honest, do you believe that it is sufficient to meet the demand on your services, even with the £300,000 if it was to be granted? I, th I think that the if you if you if you look at the increase the proposed increases that we have in there they are focused on areas which are trying to kind of take a slightly different approach to managing complaints in, in the kind of northern ireland plc perspective because you're looking at trying to kind of invest some time and energy in learning for example i mean we we have a whole host of areas where we see the same complaints coming through year on year and we do think that if we had some limited resource and the right skills to, to devote to that, we could make some inroads to stopping some of these complaints coming through. You'll be familiar with some of these areas around serious adverse incidents, continuing healthcare, you know, send complaints, these kind of things come to us. But I time suppose time again. my point is, and sorry for cutting across, my point is, given that the level of complaints have doubled and the demand on the service is much more significant, I'm asking really, there's a £300,000 scratch the surface in terms of meeting the demand on the resource or is it simply just to stay still as is or will it be used to improve service or efficiency it basically i'm asking will this resolve the issue i know the answer but will this resolve the issue in terms of the demand on your service or resources in terms of maybe backlog complaints or whatever else i mean it won't resolve the issue of you know sustained complaints but you know, it, it will allow us to to meet that to continue to meet that I mean, that, that will be challenging, but I think it will allow us to, to do that on a standstill basis. Thank you. Yeah, I think it really Can I make some in briefly on that? Yes, John. Sure. 
Um, we, we have spent, since Margaret arrived in August, uh, intensive time looking, looking at this very question. And I think we're in a position where we would view the, the additional 300,000 as the absolute minimum uh, necessary to, to enable us to continue to provide what we aspire to in terms of a quality of service, uh, and with also a little bit of allowance, as Margaret has previously mentioned, for, you know, applying some dedicated resource to the uh, to the learning and engagement aspects which strategically margaret would see as very as a very very important part of of managing the future the future demand on our services in terms of numbers of complaints so uh, i think it, it would we would see it as the absolute minimum if if, if we could bid for more uh, we would i think but we are also conscious and mindful of the, of the wider climate and Again, as, as exemplified in, in the in the advice that you received from the Department of Finance last Thursday, I appreciate your honesty in that regard, John. I think that that's important, just in, in terms of where we're at. I have noted on numerous occasions the demand on the service, and I just thought that was an appropriate question uh, to see how. And I think we have been very mindful of the current set of circumstances, um, and I suppose I'm mindful of also being very new in post. Um, so I think it is a standstill position for us. Okay, that's what I want. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I was getting at. Okay, Jim, you have another committee, so I'm going to let you come in first. If okay, you're okay you. with that. Um, did you surrender any money this year in the monitoring round? Um, we are going to. I'm going to ask John to come in on that and maybe to give an explanation for that. John. Yes. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we. Early in the year, there was, it's not, it wasn't a monitoring round as such, but there was a general appeal for contributions that bodies could make towards the central government COVID countermeasures. And in response to that, we surrendered at that time 6, 6, 60K. Uh, in, the, in the current monitoring round, we are uh, proposing to surrender a further 100K, and we're attributing that uh, substantially to the fact that uh, the half year of CSA budget that, that we had for 2021 will not now be required in, in light of the, the further uh, delay in, in the commencement of that part of our legislation. So, yeah, uh, so in total, we have, in revenue terms, we are on course to surrender £160,000 this, this financial year. And did that, but, uh, did that damage your service provision? Um, in the sense that the majority of it is, is due to a, a, a function that is not, com not, not yet commenced, the short answer to that would be that of itself does not damage your service provision in 2021. Okay, so dealing with that service that hasn't yet commenced, it's not going to be commenced by the 1st of April, is it? Uh, I'll, I'll ask maybe uh, no. Margaret or, or Paul if, if, if they don't mind on giving a view on when we most realistically think that will be commenced. Um, no, we don't think that it will be commenced on the 1st of so April. What's your best guess? That is, we are meeting with the Commission in January. Um, so we, have, we do have some preparation work to do in advance of the commencement. I think it's really difficult for me to make a guess on that. But there's going to be some headroom there. There will be some headroom there, yeah. But we did. And that's to... not factored into your bid. So what we needed to include that in budget for it to be taken recognition of. So your bid is, if I recall, two hundred and fourteen for the CSA. Is that right? Yes, that's the on ongoing annual year cost that we would so estimate. If there was a further six months delay. There's a headroom yes. there of over a hundred thousand. There is. Yeah. If I can just come in there um, again, the normal way that that type of factor, that type of issue would be factored in, is to then look in year at the monitoring rounds and where it's clear that a function is not commencing as, as early as originally planned, we would then surrender back in the first at the first available opportunity any estimated reduced requirement on, on the, any particular area such as CSA. But as, if it's self-evident that you're not going to need 214 because there's going to be some delay. Uh, what's the merit in including it in the first place? So I think at the point that we included it, we... Yes, at that point. Clear, 
that, that it wouldn't commence at that stage. I think now we are, to be honest, a little clearer maybe on the process that mm. we will need to have around that. So, and that has been relatively recently that we've had some discussion Good. and clarity on that process. Okay. Good. To be fair, that's probably the last two weeks. Yeah. Had a wee bit more. Can I ask you something else? Have you any facility to charge out for your services? We have, Bonnie Paul and I were discussing this, at the moment we don't, and there's only two possible ways, um, and Paul can maybe say a little bit in, uh, about, in Scotland about how you can do that. So one is that you would charge those public bodies on the basis yes. of how many complaints you get, um, and, and I suppose there might be a tiny little bit for me or concerns around just balancing that with continuing to ensure the independence and the quality. Um, and the other one would be in Scotland where they provided training to public bodies and recouped the full charge of that training. And I think Paul, you could probably sure, do yeah. that better than me. I mean, the, the, the first one there that Margaret talks about would be a kind of longer term and more strategic change and change the legislation and, and so forth. A kind of pluter pays principle, that would be a longer term kind of thing, which has not been put in place by any other ombudsman. Um, at this time. I think the second is, is more realistic. I think particularly if we have a, a complete standards authority function where you would provide on a cost recovery basis training services for either online or in classroom based and, and recharge public bodies. There are complications with that, um, with recharge. So the income that you receive from that and John will be able to perhaps you know elaborate on that just a little bit. Um, you you would have to you wouldn't always receive that money because it would be part of the kind of recharge that you would put back or take out of your budget, essentially. John may be able to kind of clarify that from a technical financial perspective. Yeah, I'm happy to come in on, on that. Any any income that we would generate, we need to be able to quantify it in advance. We need to be able to build it into what's called our accruing resources within, within our estimates. And uh, to the extent that we get our estimates wrong, uh, any excess that we would gain over and above what, what we have planned for would would in effect be surrendered back to the consolidated fund the other point i would make in terms of generating income from elsewhere within the, the public sector is that uh, it's circular in the sense that anything we charge would be a, would be a call on the budgets of the organ the public organizations concerned that's not to say we shouldn't do it but it, it's not as pressing in in one sense as if we were able to to obtain external income from sources other than fellow central government bodies. But except, except, again, except with respect for this point, which we discussed in the past, the penalty, to put it in those terms, on an errant public body when you make a finding against them mm -hmm. is almost non existent. I've previously described it as a slap on the wrist. If in fact there was a charge of your services, to a public body against whom you made an adverse finding, it might be quite uh, an incentive to improve uh, their provision more than the current arrangements are. You know, we've just heard from the audit office that they charge out the current year two million pounds for their services. I don't understand why the ombudsman's office couldn't charge out. They would need a change in the law, but couldn't charge out when there is an adverse finding against a council or I mean, a public body. Yeah, I mean th that. I think you, the answer to is in within your question. There is that something that we can do uh, under the current legislative framework. So it's not something that's even been considered in a Northern Ireland context or in a public service ombudsman context. Really, it's been mooted in general terms, and it's something which would be a far more kind of strategic discussion and, and legislative change that would have to happen. Okay, that's all for now. It's, a, it's an interesting suggestion and, and, and could prove... Um, yeah, one, I think that yeah. if we were to think about it, it would be good to yeah. do some research and some work on it and have yeah. a really proper look at it. Yes, maybe yeah. look, this, this kind. Um, Joanne? Thank you, Chairman. Can I just explore with you something that you've raised today, which is with regard to the, the potential two ways to, to charge out for your services? And you... I think, Margaret, it was you who had said that you'd have some concern about charging people on the number of complaints and so on because you'd have concern that would impact on the independence and quality. Um, but Scotland provides training. Is there not a danger within that aspect that 
that also has an impact on independence and quality and actually has potential to turn the Ombudsman's Office into a training organisation, uh, of which many already exist. Uh, so that's my first point, um, and I'd be interested to know how you hear, uh, what do you think about that. With regard to your, um, previously Jim had asked for your performance with regard to KPI3. Mm. Yeah. Um, yep. And the figures aren't great. In that regard, and I appreciate, Margaret, that uh, you're just in the post. Um, so presumably then, your bud you will say, <laughs> somewhat naturally, that your budgets have an impact on your ability to report. Um, okay, so let's say that, I mean, there are three options here. As, as far as the fine, the budget's concerned, either we can say yes or we can say no with caveats and potential for you to bid. What will be the impact on your reporting mechanism uh, and your ability to hit KPI 3 if you don't receive the budget and, or in circumstances where you, you have to bid? Um, and in fact, overall, then, if you are told, and, and this is where I, th I think you're in a difficult position, because obviously your baseline didn't include your new function, right? So say your baseline is adjusted accordingly to include the commencement of the new function. Um, how will you prioritise work? And what will be the deciding factors? You know, what's going to be cut? And and what what is your priority in this regard? Do you see what I'm trying to get at? I do, I do. Um, so I think, I think KPI 3 is quite complicated and I have spent some time over the last number of months unearthing KPI 3 and it's made complicated um, by some longer running cases. So. Part of what I have done since I came into role is looked at some of those run long running cases, drew a circle around them and said, OK, we need to focus on clearing these cases. But in fact, that almost has like a detrimental effect on the KPI. And I would have to ask Paul to explain exactly how that happens again. Um, so I think KPI 3 does tend to be the one with those longer investigations, it's more challenging for the office, and there can be a number of reasons for that. It is partly about resource, but it's also partly about complexity. It's about when we seek independent professional advice and our length of time in getting that. It's about analysis, and it, sometimes it only takes four or five of those to be very complex and difficult. Um, and we are balancing getting people a response on that with ensuring that we have absolutely done the yeah. level of diligence and quality that we need to do. So that, that is difficult. And obviously, if our budget were to sit the same or retract, then in some ways, no matter how hard we're working upstream to try and get those cases through and get resolution and settlement where that is appropriate, you will get a lie. I mean, I, I think... The team have been working very hard on that, but I think inevitably you'll get a lag. I think there's two things, if I'm being really honest, I think there's two things for me about the Ombudsman's Office. One is that absolutely core investigative response, which I think does have to be a priority when people come through, and in some respects the absolute priority in responding to complainants. But the bit that sits alongside that for me is those bigger lessons and in some respects if I take something like continuing healthcare we have 10 cases sitting over a period of time on that and there is an absolutely distinctive issue on that about, about the kind of guidance from the department what trusts are doing and it is when I've looked at those reports it is the same repetitive issue again and again and again so actually it seems to me that there does need to be some space for us to go. This is the same issue across these 10 very long, very detailed cases. 
where people have had really difficult experiences, actually we need to address that. So the, it's, for me, I find it quite hard to totally separate out those two things. Inevitably, the complainant coming through the door will have absolute highest priority for us, and I think that is right and proper, but it does sit alongside taking that broader approach to it, because actually if I could solve that problem, there is 10 very complex cases that wouldn't be taken as much of that resource. Paul, is there anything on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the part of your question around the impact, and yes, of course, that you know, further increase in complaints um, and not having an additional resource would lead to a further impact on KPI 3. We continue to seek ways to, to improve that, and to be honest, some of the context of that is that we have um, delivered significantly more of those investigative decisions at KPI 3 uh, in each of those years, uh, and we also, at the early stages, continue to, to do more decisions there within the, the, the 10 weeks and meet, the, meet those KPIs to a very high standard. So, so that you know, push to try and achieve those other resolutions, for example, is a really positive uh, outcome, which tells a kind of fuller picture there. But yeah, if, if we had ongoing increases, as we have done for the last four or five years, and if we had, for example, a COVID surge, then the thing that is going to be difficult to keep meeting is the long, long KPI 3 investigations target. So that would be something we'd have to really, really look at. Um, uh, to come back to your first question, which was around training, um, it, it is a good question that's asked a lot in the context of complaint stands authority as well, where, where you have a sense of that two cores, a dual role. Independence would not be affected because you are separating out the, the relationship you have with the bodies in that respect, who, for example, is undertaking that role. And you know, you're, you're providing advice on good practice complaints handling. You're not talking about the context of their individual complaints or decisions they made on planning or diagnosis, for example. You're advising them on how to manage, progress, investigate complaints effectively and to a high standard. Those are two separate things which don't impact on your independence on the, the facts and context of an individual case later on that arrives at the office. There you are know, separate kind of aspects to that. Uh, and in terms of quality, you know, that was the second part. You said independence and quality would be affected. The quality, actually, th this is a way of driving that up because one of the major issues we have is that a lot of the complaints coming to us, aside from the underlying issue of poor service, we're finding huge issues with complaints handling and how they're handled. So if you can try and manage and raise up the standards of the public bodies in terms of how they handle those complaints, you should have an impact in terms of what's coming to you in terms of the ability to investigate them without going back multiple times to those bodies for additional information, for example. So the only types of training that Scotland is providing is purely about organisations and how they handle complaints better? Yes, so it's across the full, full range of um, complaints, Alan, but it is focused on that area. They're not, you know, they, they will also go into areas which is more about the learning and impact, where they will perhaps go out and you know, provide outreach around about um, particular subject areas. So we mentioned the LSN or serious adverse incidents. You know, there's learning to be had from our investigations. That kind of outreach work um, is what would be proposed in the learning improvement to officers rather than any specific training. The training would be very much specific to good complaints handling across All that right, okay, move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, can I bring in uh, Emma Rogan, please? Hi, Emma. You're on mute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just have one um, question. You, you mentioned about the, the, the impact of, of dealing with the, the complaints that you receive. Um, how many staff have you currently got in place to progress and deal with those complaints? And how does that compare the number of staff with what you had five years ago? The, the figure, the f yeah, um, current figures that we have are 41 FTE as a total, as an organisation. I, I don't actually have to hand the split of those who are directly involved in the complaints investigations. Um, I'd have to come back on that, but all I can say is that is the vast majority of those employed in the organisation across the different functions that we do investigate. Um, I also, I'm afraid, don't have to hand the, the, the figures from five years ago in terms of the, the numbers of staff, so unless John McGinty has those to hand, yeah. then we would have to come back in writing on that. Okay. 
Um, sorry, Paul, if I may just contribute on that. Uh, the number that we had in whole time equivalent terms five years ago was 28. Um, and say in terms of the, um, the own initiative, will that increase and, and will there be an extra member of staff added to that and will that increase the, the speed at which reports are published? And, and if so, um, there's, there's two extra members, I keep me right, two extra members of staff are proposed for the better learning and improvement um, from the complaints, which I, I, I have to agree, I think it's, um, it's a must. You know what? What's the point in in not taking the learning from from if there's there's trends and 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 things are, are being repeated? It, it doesn't doesn't make sense not to um to learn from it and improve the outcomes for for people and for complainants. Um, does that mean then it's a total of three extra staff that are required? Yes. So um, that own initiative team is a bespoke team. Um, which the Ombudsman can use where they have a reasonable suspicion of systemic maladministration. And you will know, because I've spoken a little bit about it, that we have been doing the PIP investigation, and that has taken um, quite a long period of time. And, I, and um, I am hopeful that that report will be will probably be end of January, February now. Um, and when we undertake something like that, it is an enormous piece of work. So we, part of the reason that we um, wanted to look for an extra member of staff for OI was to allow us to have both a long investigation running, but potentially some sh a shorter, one or two shorter own investigations running across the, um, the year as well, so that we were speeding up. There, because there are things that come to the office and I, uh, that you know, whether there would be a reasonable suspicion of systemic maladministration. And also, I think when the office did the preparatory work for it, there were quite a number of potential OIs. Paul, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. Yeah, I think, just, just to kind of summarise, I think that, yeah, the, the aim would be to try and do more of these uh, uh, and ideally shorter, although I would, I would kind of caveat that sometimes the procedural steps we have to go through irrespective of the scale of the investigation means that the length can still be you know, certainly would be in the territory of that one year so June to to June for June to now for the rest of one is on the long side um, you would hope to bring that down but you wouldn't be able to kind of get it down you know significantly beyond that because you have to provide opportunity to comment and and the various kind of safe procedural safeguard checks thank you if, if I may just come in momentarily, uh, in answer to your question, Emma, about the three, you're correct in saying that, that, the, that those two areas, own initiative and learning and improvement, would represent three additional staff members. So, so just to be clear, any additional staff members to support the hoped for commencement of the Complaint Standards Authority would, would be additional to that again. Okay, thank you. All right, Emma. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay. Uh, can broadcast and bring in Alan Chambers, please? Alan, just unmute yourself if you can. Thank you. Are you okay, Alan? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I have no questions at this time, Chair. Sorry. You're happy enough, Alan. Okay, no problem. Well, that's everything. So, thanks very much again. Um, appreciate your time and your answers to our questions. Thank you for taking okay. the time to look at it properly with us. Appreciate Thank you. It. No problem. Okay, we'll move into. Yeah, can broadcast and uh, bring everyone. Uh, uh, bring, our, bring our members into the spotlight, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and our witnesses should be. Okay, let's go. Hey. Can broadcasting remove John, please? Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. So we're going now to the red. Yep. So if members are agreed, can we move into? Closed session, the next day of business. Yeah, okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.